As a game designer, I play a crap ton of games. I've been playing them since I was five years old. I'm 40 now, so that's 35 years of having games in my life in some way or another. If you're somewhat involved with making indie games, you'll probably have a few friends, probably swap games between each other, and offer feedback. And it pains me to say this because I've actually had this happen a lot where I exchange a demo with somebody and I have to be kind of like brutal in my feedback. Many game demos actually fail to impress and what I wanted to do is create this video just as a way of kind of talking about the common things that I run into when I get game demos and I don't like them. So a lot of times I'll play a few levels, I'll find the game to be lacking in some kind of important respect, and then I'll just stop playing it. And at that point I'll send a note, I try and, try and word it kindly, but a lot of times that doesn't happen. I'll say something like, I stopped playing at level five because I didn't see much depth and figured the next 45 levels would be more of the same thing. Uh, or I would say something like, this game is basically a maze. There aren't many interesting choices in the first few levels. Even though you have 100 levels, I stopped playing at level 7. So it sounds kind of harsh. You can sort of feel free to call me an asshole. But for me, this isn't about crafting some kind of asshole game designer persona. It's about genuinely helping people. And if I hold back my real criticism, I know I'm not doing them any favors. Oftentimes, I have to tell people they should scrap the whole game but I didn't find one bit of deep, interesting gameplay in the whole thing, that the set of rules and game mechanics they picked just don't yield interesting possibilities. And the only way to get there is to wipe the slate clean and start over with a different set of rules. Again, I don't say these things because I enjoy crushing dreams. I say them because I've had to scrap my own creations over and over and over again. I think that's part of a healthy way of making things. Uh, having the willingness to admit that you've gone down a dead end gives you the ability to turn around and find a more fruitful path. Of course, this raises the question, what is a fruitful path in game design? How do you know when you've got something interesting that people will probably want to play? Although it's fashionable right now to say you should just make what you feel and art can't be judged, I, I think that attitude is bullshit and I think it leads to bad art. Uh, besides, you're the one who clicked on a video promising to help you fix your boring game, so you tacitly believe there is such a thing as an objectively good game. Uh, if you disagree, you can, you can just stop watching. Game design, at its core, is the art of creating interesting choices. To make interesting choices possible, we create game worlds. The term world is really slippery. It can be approached from a number of different angles. Mathematically, a world is a space of possibilities. It has a geometric nature. Logically, a world is a set of rules which are enforced such that the rules yield possibilities or events that can happen in that world. Psychologically, each of us is a being in the world. We experience a world which we are a part of, where every phenomenon in that world has an inherent meaning that we engage with automatically. A world is an objectively real place, which is mathematical and logical in the scope of its possibilities, but is also a place we are in, a place which presents itself to us with inherent meaning. To design a world with interesting choices, you need to be more of a generalist someone who can work with math, logic, computer science, and psychology all in the same day. Some of the worst games I've played tend to come from programmers who just want to code. For them, the game is an afterthought. They make this elaborate engine first, and then at the very end, they put their content on top of it. And indeed, that's actually the way that they talk about it and it sort of betrays or belies the, the underlying thinking that's going on. It's not something that they want to do. They don't really want to make the game. They want to, they want to make the engine, right? And the game is just kind of this excuse to do the engine. So I don't do that, and this often causes friction between me and a lot of programmers. 
Uh, I have said that a world can be described mathematically as a possibility space. So let's put a visual to that. Here I have created a one dimensional world using the level editor for my game Moo Solutions. You can see that the lumberjack can only travel left and right. Remember how I said that game design is the art of creating interesting choices? Well, take a look. What choices are there here? You can either go left or right. That's it. Now, is that interesting? Uh, maybe if you're a baby, but most kids and grown adults wouldn't consider this to be an interesting choice. Let's try adding another dimension so it's more of a grid. Is this better? Kind of, but it's still not that interesting. We've merely multiplied the possible choices by two. So instead of going left or right, you can now go left, right, up, or down. There are four choices, and none of them are really all that interesting. Well, what if we put a bunch of trees in the way and a goal at the end? Does that make it more interesting? Well, this is sort of that maze phase of game designer progression, right? That, that is what we call a maze, and it's still not that interesting. You have a choice as to which paths you can take, but there's only really one correct path, and it's pretty easy to trace that out. Like, any five-year-old kid could do that. Well, what if it's a really big maze, right? Like, what if we just obfuscate things so much, you'll still uh, have to engage with it, but it'll just take, like, a really long time, right? Well, it's the same problem. The choices themselves are not that interesting. You've merely tried to hide the lack of an interesting choice behind a bunch of unnecessary complexity. And might I add, this is actually something that I see in quote unquote modern games a lot. There is say a lot of things that I really liked about uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I did not like the maze labyrinths. I just think that was not creative, wasn't really that interesting, it was just kind of something they threw in because it, it looked cool, but from an actual gameplay perspective, didn't really afford me anything new to do, right? So at this point, we could make our game three-dimensional and, and we could add an entire access to that uh, possibility space or an, or an entire dimension. The player can move up, down, left, or right, or up and down on the z-axis, right? But this still only gives us a linear gain in terms of the number of choices. Now we've gone from four to six, right? So like we still haven't really done much there. Um, to get a much larger gain in terms of the real possibility space, we would need to introduce some notion of state. So what if there were some entity in the world with four states? What if it could face up, down, left, or right, and you could alter the direction that it faces? Well, in my game, Moose Lucians, there is such an entity. It's called a moose. Moose are one of the game's stateful entities, which work to expand the possibility space, allowing for a larger number of choices, some of which are interesting. The player can manipulate the moose in a variety of ways. You can step in front of a moose and anger him, which causes him to charge across the map. When a moose hits another moose on the side, it causes the moose to rotate in the direction it was hit. So now the game not only has a geometrical space to it, it also has a set of logically consistent rules which govern the way stateful entities can be transformed from one state into another. So if you add nothing else, this already yields some possibilities that could be used in a puzzle. For example, given this set of rules, it's possible for the player to walk in front of a moose, anger the moose, and cause the moose to charge to a position that traps the player between the moose and the forest, preventing the player from moving. Indeed, this is the first level in the game. To solve this level, you just have to notice that this kind of thing can happen, and you have to pick a strategy that prevents it from happening. So instead of continuing to walk forward past the moose, you can anger him, walk backwards, and then avoid getting trapped. That's the moose solution to that particular puzzle. Although it's a really simple and easy example, 
we actually just approached what I would call the holy grail of game design, something which is often called emergent gameplay. Getting trapped between the moose and the forest is just one interesting consequence of this set of rules that we've picked. Good games often surprise us with this explosion of interesting possibilities we couldn't have predicted. That's how we can play them for hundreds of hours and not get bored. Once you've got a few systems with rules and some stateful entities, you can keep expanding on the gameplay you've built. Once I had the moose and the stealth systems in place, I thought it'd be cool to have a pushable block the player can hide behind. This opens up even more possibilities. You can push a block in front of a moose, walk past him, and then have another moose hit the moose you just sneaked past, causing him to rotate. Doing so frees up your block so you can use it to sneak past another moose. There you go. That's another puzzle. No, seriously, that's like puzzle 11 in the game. It was designed around that insight. So I'm hoping you can see that every puzzle I picked was actually something I designed around something I discovered while playing the game. So it's not so much that I'm designing the puzzles um, like top down, it's more that I'm playing my own game and seeing what happens, seeing the consequences of this set of rules that I've picked that's consistent, right? And then I say, oh, that, that happens. Okay, let's design a puzzle or let's like force a situation where the player has to encounter that and actually grapple with it and deal with it and, and like really understand it. So back when I programmed the rules for Moose Solutions in, I actually didn't even know that you could use a moose to free up a block. That's not something that I foresaw. Sometimes if I think of a set of rules, I actually can foresee the thing that's gonna happen. And then I'll be like, oh, okay, like that's a cool puzzle, I can write that down. And I do have like a big notebook of stuff where I write it down and I'm like, okay, like here's, you know, 15 interesting things that happen when you have this set of rules. But a lot of times when I'm making games, I don't even know that these things are something that could happen. And then later on, I'm like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. So I think one way that you're knowing if you're on the right track when you're designing games is if you very frequently find yourself being surprised by the thing that you're playing. Because if you're surprised, then chances are your players are surprised. And that's, I think, the core to like an interesting game. I want to be surprised. I don't want to like already know how to do it. I don't want to already know how to solve it. I want to feel like I'm genuinely exploring something. I want to feel like I'm making real discoveries, authentic discoveries as I'm playing my game, right? The trick, of course, when you're thinking about expanding gameplay in a game is to not overdo it. Um, overdoing it or, or adding in too much to your game, I think can make it feel uh, contrived. I think it's better if every new rule or system that's in your game ultimately relates back to something in the game. I feel like that makes it seem more like a coherent experience. So in Moose Lucians, for example, I really tightly themed the game around the moose and I made it so that everything relates back to moose, right? So everything kind of comes back to that, to that core set of rules. By the time I added pushable blocks back into the game, it already had trees that stopped the moose when they charge. The player could also hide behind the trees to avoid angering a moose. It's, it's kind of like got a stealth mechanic to it. So in a certain way, the pushable block is really like a tree that you can push. Another way of thinking about it is it's like a free tree. One of the ways I like to expand gameplay in my games is to take something that's already in the game and then try to find a way to make it more free. One example of that is the rail carts. They actually came about when I thought, what's a good way to free up the moose? What's a good way to give the player more of an ability to control the moose directly? I was thinking, what if uh, instead of the only way that you could move the moose was by walking in front of him and angering him, what if the other way that you could move the moose was to push him around somehow? And I thought, well, problem is moose have such staggering bulk, you know, they're very large creatures. But if we put them into a cart of some kind or something that people would believe is pushable, 
now all of a sudden it, it kind of makes sense. Like I can actually push this moose around. And if I can push the moose around, I have a lot more freedom in terms of where they're going, controlling their, their position. And generally speaking, more freedom usually allows for more possibilities, which allows for more interesting things to happen. And then I'm going to play that game for a while, find those interesting things, and then present them back to you, the player. So trying to look at something and saying, okay, this is already in the game. How do we kind of free it up a little bit? What's a good way to do that? Usually can result in some pretty, pretty good extra gameplay. So I like to say freedom is just the feeling we get when a world has a sufficient amount of meaningful states to yield a large number of possibilities. Therefore, the goal when designing games is to always increase freedom. There's only one place where freedom can conflict with the design, and that's in the early stages when you're introducing the player to the game. If you give the player too much freedom or too many choices too early, the game can be confusing and difficult to learn. So there do need to be places in the game that are more constrained and simplified, places where you teach people how to play the game. You can and should give people as much freedom as they want, of course, but that's also not an excuse to not teach people. Games should expand toward ever-increasing amounts of freedom, but how do you know when to stop expanding your game's world? After all, you do have to ship something, so if you never actually say, we're gonna stop, then you can't possibly reap the rewards of your hard work. So you have to find, there has to be some way to know how to stop doing this. I think it's usually time to call it quits when you notice that new rules and systems you keep adding are just covering the same ground. If a thing you add ends up being just another way to do something that's already in the game, it probably won't add much more to the game the player will correctly perceive that as filler content. I started to feel this way about Moose Lucians once it got up to about 50 puzzles. I tried a ton of different ideas, but I stopped feeling surprised by what I found. Most of the new things I made just felt like a slight variation on what was already in the game. It felt like I was covering the same ground, but maybe with a different angle. So I would just say, look out for that. There's a huge temptation to make big games because big games tend to be more marketable. You can make a lot more money off of big games. But I also find just when I'm playing a lot of games, in particular puzzle games, I feel like maybe they could have stopped like halfway through and said, eh, like these are the interesting ones. The rest from here is like, we just felt the need to have 200 puzzles because someone said that, to make a marketable puzzle game, you gotta have 200 puzzles. You have to create a world that fits with the rule set that should be the, the size that makes sense for what you actually discover. I kept cutting and cutting and cutting puzzles that I didn't feel presented some unique or interesting insight. And that's how I got back down to the amount that I picked. Moose Lucians is fundamentally a game about the moose. If I can't relate a new piece of gameplay back to the moose in some way, it doesn't belong in the game, even if that gameplay idea is an interesting idea. So you definitely want to stick to your theme. You definitely want to keep it coherent. And you might even decide that your theme should change, right? One way I could have changed my theme to expand the gameplay in Moose Solutions, maybe I just decide, you know what, this isn't going to be about moose anymore. Maybe um, it's like more abstract, like it's about angering animals, right? So now it's not just about moose, it's about um, other kinds of animals that have this sort of stealth mechanic where you walk in front of them and they get mad and then they do something. And then it would be, you know, animal illusions or something. That might, you, there might be ways you could tweak the theme to fit or to expand upon your gameplay. Again, I tried all of those different uh, sets of rules, but they didn't really get me to that place where I felt like I found anything interesting. I just felt like sticking with the moose ultimately is this was the sweet spot, and I just stopped there. So your mileage may vary on that one. It's okay to ship a small game or no game at all 
if you don't find many interesting consequences of your game's rules. People feel like they need to ship something just because they spent all this time experimenting, but I think that's a mistake because it actually takes a lot more time to polish a game after you've figured out what kind of gameplay will be in it than it does to just experiment with gameplay. So you don't want to spend the next three years of your life polishing some gameplay that you thought up in like a weekend. Uh, that, that is absolutely a recipe for burnout. And people still won't like your game if the gameplay isn't good. So instead, I would focus on making something that is fun to play in spite of its graphics. And once you have most of the gameplay figured out, once you have most of the encounters, puzzles, world, all that figured out, definitely share that rough prototype with your friends. Uh, people will play unpolished games, even if the core gameplay is interesting. That was actually my experience with Moose Solutions. I put out a fairly rough looking prototype with some really kind of, you know, not great art. And it had, I think, 40 puzzles in it. My friends played it. To my surprise, I actually saw some of them get all the way through those first 40 puzzles. And that to me was like a signal because what it said is, okay, people aren't just bailing after the first puzzle. There are some people that are continuing to play this even after they've hit that point where they're like, hey, Ted's our friend, we just kind of want to be nice. They keep playing. And if you see that kind of behavior, then you know that you've got something that has appeal beyond people just trying to you know, be social and please their friends and, and play things just because you sent it to them. So definitely look out for that. Look out for these signals of people maybe being hooked on your game long after you told them this is a thing you're doing. That's a really, really good sign if people play all the way through your thing. So that's how I knew it was time to put this game on Steam. I, it was a really good signal that I think people will actually play this all the way through. Games always have their bugs and issues, but a game that is interesting at its core will keep players in spite of its flaws. I really believe that. This is definitely not an excuse to avoid fixing the bugs. It's more to say that you need to be self-aware and critical and realize that your biggest problem might not be the game's bugs. If your game isn't interesting to begin with, then there's really no point in fixing the bugs because people aren't gonna play long enough to find them. So if you've got a bug on level 50 <laughs> And it's some new mechanic or something that you've you know you've been working on, and it's you know, you're spending two hours on it maybe or however long. Maybe don't fix that right away because the thing is, you don't even know if people are playing your game long enough to get there. So figure out if people are interested enough to get to the point where they're dealing with your bugs first. Oftentimes, the biggest bug is the game just not presenting the player with interesting choices. The game, basically, if you boil it down, being a maze. And I would say you need to fix that first. Before I leave you, I wanted you to know I've put Moose Solutions on sale for the weekend. You can get the game at a 20% discount on Steam. I recognize that this kind of dates the video. If you can't buy the game right now, just wishlist it, and I'm sure there will be a sale sometime down the road. I'm gonna do a bunch of Steam festivals in the coming year, so definitely watch for sales that happen through being a part of those festivals. And thanks for watching and, and have a great week.